want to welcome you to our Good Friday worship service. And thank you for joining us, whether it's via video or radio broadcast by the Falls Radio. We want to encourage you during this time of our coronavirus pandemic, our stay-at-home order, that we can still worship together as a body of believers, as a family of Christ. And so again, we give you thanks for joining us and sharing in this time of worship. Let us pray. Dear Lord God, we trust that you continue to be present with us. We give you thanks for your compassion, for your love, for your mercy, for your grace. And we pray that you'll watch over all those healthcare workers who are ministering to those who are ill. We pray for your comfort and peace for all those who have lost loved ones. And we pray that during this time, we will not have a spirit of fear, but that we'll place our confidence in you. Because we know that you are with us. We know that your love for us endures forever. And that you will see us through this. Because your promises, not even the gates of hell, will prevail against your church. Your church has survived greater trials than these, Lord. And so again, we give you thanks for your promises. We give you thanks for your love. And on this day especially, we give you thanks for your son, Jesus Christ, who went to the cross on our behalf. All of our sins were nailed with him on that cross. He took our guilt and our shame, Lord. And in place, he gave us his life and the promise of everlasting life. And for this, Lord, we are eternally grateful. We pray this prayer in Jesus' holy name. Amen.
Thanks to Nate Bjorgi and Faith Lutheran for hosting us here today. I'm Pastor Ryan Olson from the Alliance Church in Little Falls. A reading from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 15, beginning at verse 22. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it, and they crucified him, dividing up his clothes. They cast lots to see what each would get. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves, he saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross, that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, Listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus, saw how he died. He said, Surely this man was the Son of God. Hello, I'm Pastor Greg from Grace Covenant Church. This is a little weird, isn't it? Normally, I really enjoy the Good Friday services as we gather together as the people of God uh, to worship together, to pray together to celebrate together what God has done. But this year I'm looking into a camera and imagining all of you at home instead of seeing you in front of me. You might be feeling like this is a little weird too, as you've had to get used to sitting in your living rooms or sitting around your computers, uh, turning on the computer when church starts, rather than getting into your cars and driving uh, to, your, to your churches. It's weird sitting at home rather than in are the sanctuaries that we're comfortable with. But even though we're apart, we are still together, still worshiping together, still praying together, still depending on and trusting God together. And so I'm glad that we get to be with you, even if it's only in spirit at this moment. As this pandemic has grown and taken shape, a lot of changes have come. Our, one thing that has been uh, often talked about during this time is a common phrase, essential. We talk about essential businesses, essential workers, essential travel. What makes something essential? I think the answer has been, can other things function without it? Can our lives go on without it? Can our country survive without it? Essential doesn't mean all that is important. But essential keeps the rest from falling apart. The essential things are the things that we hang our hat on. Today we're going to be talking about the essentials of Easter. The core of what Easter is all about. What everything else in the Christian life hangs its hat on. In the Bible, Paul writes about these essentials in 1 Corinthians 15, 3-4, when he says... For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Paul says that when it comes to the Christian life, this is key. So let's start with that first part. Christ died for our sins. We start with a big problem. You know, as serious as a worldwide pandemic of COVID-19 is, 
The Bible tells us that there is another disease that has been spreading throughout the world since almost the beginning of time. This disease at times can be easily ignored, but it has a 100% infection rate. The name of that disease, it's sin. Now I know sin is a word that we don't like to use a lot today. Something that we might look at as old fashioned or, or all about not having any fun. But the idea of sin is tied directly to the idea that there is a God who created the world and everything in it, including us. If there's a God who is over all things, who made all things for his purpose, then to do anything that goes against this God, to, that goes against his purpose and his will, that's problematic, right? I don't think that's too far of a stretch. Sin, plain and simple, is anything that we do that goes against God's will, against his plan. Sin looks at the God who's over all things, made all things, and knows all things, and says, I'll just do it my own way, thank you very much. The Bible tells us about sin entering the world when Adam and Eve took a fruit from a tree that God told them not to eat from. But you know, it's not just that. Sin infects you and me as well. We all know very well what it's like to ignore God and to choose to do what we want instead. The problem is that there are consequences for this. God made us for relationship with Him to be close to Him. But ignoring God, rejecting God, disobeying God, it damages our relationship with Him. It drives a wedge between us as it would with any relationship. It's like the ultimate social distancing. The more we sin, the farther away we push God. But this isn't just an issue of hurt feelings. It's actually a matter of something far worse. A matter of treason against the ruler of all. See, our sin is rebellion. It's an attempt to undermine God's purpose and plan, and even go so far as to try and usurp the throne of God. You might not think this, but all sin, from the, the biggest to the smallest, is treasonous. So sin leads to separation from God, but it also makes us guilty of treason against Him. The Bible tells us that this leads to one final consequence, death. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. Separation from the giver of life. Punishment for the treason that we have committed. Death is the ultimate consequence. Both in a general sense of decay in our world that leads us all to live our lives under its shadow. But also ultimately an eternal death, an eternal separation from God. The truth of the matter is that sin will kill more people than COVID-19 ever will. Throughout history, attempts have been made to try and find a cure for sin. The best and the brightest have attempted to fix the problem that it brings to remove the guilt and stain of sin and to restore a relationship with God. You might have tried this in the past, or maybe you're trying to do this right now. Trying hard to be a good person. Trying to do everything right in hopes that you could somehow be good enough to earn God's love. But the truth of the matter is, being a good person isn't the cure for this problem of sin. In fact, there's nothing that you can do, nothing that I can do, to be good enough to restore what sin has destroyed. No amount of going to church or being kind to others can cure this disease. And its ultimate result will always be separation and death. There was nothing that we could do. So, God, because of his great love, 
did something for us. Sin separates us from God. How do you feel about that? Do you feel separated from God today? But I also want to ask you, how does God feel about that? And maybe more importantly, how do you feel God feels about that? How do you feel that God feels about you today? The Bible says that Jesus came to die for our sins. How do you feel about that? And how did Jesus feel about you? My goal for us today is for you to feel God's heart, for you to feel God's forgiveness, for you to have a purpose in life, a significance and a security but to feel what he felt. Have you ever gone the extra mile for someone else? What would you do if you were God looking at this world in sin? For seldom do we ever go the extra mile. And in fact, in this day and age, we are having a tendency to back up and not do so much for the other people. Now we're in a pandemic where we're told to go home and stay away from other people. And yet we hear stories of people going out into the community to do for other people what no one else will do, to risk disease, to risk their lives in some cases. 
How does God feel about us and our sin? We live as if there are no ramifications for the way we live our lives. We live as if there is no God. The Apostle Paul talks in Romans chapter 3. We have a tendency to not want to understand what others are going through, but would rather have them understand what we're going through. We are slow to look to God for answers for life's issues. Sometimes we don't seek Him at all. Sometimes we've gone throughout our entire day before praying to Him or asking Him for the way, the truth, and the life. Sometimes we turn to other things for answers. Sometimes we replace God with whatever works. I saw someone at the hospital the other day. I believe the statue at uh, St. Gabriel's Hospital has Gabriel as the angel, a statue of Gabriel out front. And as the worker went past us, she went to the statue and rubbed the foot. And I was wondering about the value of that. We turn to a variety of different things. The Bible says no one does good that our tongues practice deceit. And we certainly see that today. We're not sure who we can trust. We're not sure that we can trust what they say. We question everything. We become cynical. Mouths have been full of cursing and bitterness. It is normal to curse. It's normal to take God's name in vain. And we do so without considering how God feels about that. Profanity is normal. We have a tendency to hang on to grudges and offenses. We're slow to forgive, and we never will forget. The Bible says we are shit swift to shed innocent blood. We don't care if someone else get hurt. Older people have very little value. Unborn have little value. Paul continues in saying that the way of peace is not known. There is no fear of God. There is no considering about how God feels about us in our sin. We want to live peaceful lives. We want to have peaceful lives, but many of us don't have peace. So what we need to do is to get right with God. How do we do that? If we look at the Old Testament, we have to offer sacrifices. Some of those times, there's a verse that I read that said we need to bring a bull to sacrifice on the altar every day. And I'm wondering about how that is even possible. I am certainly glad that our altars here today do not require the blood of bulls and goats and rams because God provided a solution. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You see, we don't have to work to come to God. We don't have to work to pay for our sin. God did it. God did it for you. God did it for me. God loves you. He feels that way about you. God loves the world as a whole. He feels that way about the world. He doesn't want anyone to be lost. He doesn't want any to turn from him. He wants to provide answers to the questions that we are asking in our life today. I was asked a question recently. How is it possible for you to tell me that God is loving if he's going to send his only son to the cross to die? How is it possible for God to be a loving God to send his son through the whippings and the scourgings and all that he had to go through? Is that a loving God? 
God knew that there was something more than what we experience here on earth. For the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross, despised its shame, and is now seated at the right hand of God the Father. There's something bigger than the things of this world. There's something more than the benefits of this world. And you know what? Jesus knew his purpose. He knew when he left heaven and came down to earth that eventually he was going to have to go to Jerusalem. It is recorded that since the day of Jesus' birth, every year he and his family went to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. But once he began his ministry... Things changed. He was no longer able to go to Jerusalem to celebrate that Passover. But Jesus left heaven because of how he felt about you. Jesus left heaven because he loved the world and he loved you. And he was willing to do whatever it takes to provide the solution between us and God, praise God. Have you ever anticipated that you would need to go through something very difficult in order to eat to in order to get to an end result that was worth it? They talk about one of the problems with COVID-19 and the stay-at-home order in that we're going to gain weight. And I have found that it is easier to eat than it is to exercise. It's easier to sit than it is to get up on that treadmill. And while I do not have any first-hand experience, I do not know why any woman would want to go through childbirth. I have sat alongside of several who were going through the pain of childbirth. It is excruciating. It is something that I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. And yet, every time when they have that little baby in their arms, it is worth it all. What about those who are willing to risk their lives for the coronavirus? I admire those medical people, all of the people. I can't list them all, but all of the people that are willing to risk their lives to take care of others, that others might benefit. You see, we are in the world, but we are not of it. We need to be looking in another dimension. And Jesus knew what would happen when he went back to Jerusalem. He knew it was going to be one of the most excruciating weeks that he could experience on earth. There was some joy as he got on the donkey and he was going back towards Jerusalem. But as he was coming near the city, he looked at the city and he proclaimed, if you only would know what would bring you peace. Oh, I know pastors get this. They normally have a bunch of information that they want to get to their people. They want the people to win. They want the people to be in victory. They want the people to get the information, to take it and run and walk and leap and praise God and, and be victorious in every area of their life. But Jesus knew that the world as a whole, as represented by Jerusalem at that moment, they weren't getting it. Sometimes I feel like I never get it. Sometimes I feel like, as my dad said about mules, that he needed to get hit over the head with a two-by-four to get their attention, and then you can get them to do what you want them to do. Sometimes I wonder if God doesn't feel that way about me. Because sometimes I get hit over the head with a two-by-four. Jesus began to feel the weight of the world. 
He knew this would be the last week in his life. He wanted his disciples and the world to get it. The Bible records tons of information that he dispensed to people in that last week of life. He got to the Last Supper. He told his disciples of things that would happen. Peter made a promise to him at that point. I will go with you anywhere. I will do whatever it takes. And Jesus looked back at him and said he knew that Peter was going to deny him. And he said before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane. He took his disciples. And then he went a little bit farther, taking three of the most important, the ones that he had spent most of his time with, the, mo the ones that he had invested his time with. And he said, sit here and pray. He said, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and watch with me. Have you ever made a promise to a friend that I'll go with you wherever you go? I'll do whatever you need me to do? Especially when there's someone that has been lost in a family. What do you need? I'll be there for you. Have you ever called on that friend? And said, I need you to pray. I need you to be here. And that's what Jesus did to these three disciples. And because Jesus knew what was coming, he prayed, Father, take this cup from me if it's possible. He knew from a physical perspective that this was going to be a tough couple of days. Yet he said, not as I will, but as you will. How do you think he was feeling? The Bible says that he was under so much stress that he dropped, his sweat was as drops of blood. It's a medical term called hemotidrosis, where the capillaries in the face actually break and come out of this pores of sweat. He was under so much stress. And yet those that were closest to him fell asleep. One of the 12 disciples that he had handpicked and spent his life investing in sold him out for 30 pieces of silver. As he was being arrested, he heard a rooster crow. And he looked back at Peter, and their eyes met. And they both knew. You see, I don't think Peter had any intention of denying Jesus. I think that Peter had simply said, I'm going to go. But what happened was when he was there warming himself, he wanted, I believe, wanted to get close enough to Jesus to hear what was going on. But he was close enough to be recognized by the servant girl and then one of the other people that recognized him was the cousin of the man whose ear was cut off in the garden. He was recognized and I don't think that Peter thought any big thing about it. I'll just say, hey, I don't know him because I want to get close and I want to hear. But then his eyes met Jesus after the rooster crowed. How would you feel if many lie about you? How would you feel if a criminal, a murderer is chosen above you to be released. How would you feel if a crown of thorns, those thorns being an inch and a half long, those thorns being very sharp, were put, put on your head? How would you feel if the soldiers, if those in control of you take a stick and hit that thorn on the head so many times? Jesus was mocked. 
Jesus was spit on. Jesus was nailed to the cross. Jesus went through excruciating pain. He went through a slow suffocation because he loved you and me. Because he saw in us something more than he was experiencing. There was a joy set before him. He endured the cross, despised its shame. And while he was going through these things, I believe God was allowing the weight of sin and the weight of the world to be placed on him. While my sin separates me from God, at that moment, my sin was separating Jesus from God. Until he got to the point on the cross where he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus felt like God was a million miles away as he shouldered the weight of my sin. We oftentimes ask the question when we're feeling overwhelmed, God, where are you? We need to know how God feels about us. Jesus knew his purpose and he was willing to go through. But as Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah 53, surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Why? Because God loves you. Because God loves me. And he wants a relationship with us. Paul said in Romans 3.25, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. John says, to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children not born of natural descent, nor of human decision, nor of a husband's will, but born of God. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. God provided a solution. Will you accept the solution he has provided for you? He gave his life that we might have life. What more could he give?
very honored and proud of uh, her gifts and her talents, so I appreciate you sharing that. My name is Pastor Sam Wohlbauer. I am the youth and executive pastor at Living Hope Church here in Little Falls, and it is a pleasure to be with you. I want to thank you for worshiping with us. Thank you again to everybody that's making this happen, the, the tech team and our video team and uh, pastors who've put in prayer and time. So I want to thank uh, Pastor Greg and Pastor Tim for setting up the essentials of Easter. Uh, they did a phenomenal job of explaining the problem and the solution. And so the question now is, what do we do with what we just heard? What do we do with what was just shared with us? Most of us realize that we're not perfect. And there may be some of you who realize that, man, there has to be more. What do I do? And that's the moment right now that you're brought to is, what is my response? What is your response with what has been shared. And that's our third point in the essentials of Easter is the response. Now I'm going to be honest with you. I'm the guy who often uh, just starts projects. There's things that need to get done in my house. So I'll start the project and I won't always have the proper tools or maybe I don't always know how it's exactly going to go. So I just jump in and I do it. And so I'll hop in there and say we have to fix our drain. So I begin to fix the drain. I can get it apart. I can sometimes even like fix the actual, like get the, the, the clog unstuck. And then it's the process where I end up getting stuck, usually, is putting it back together. Uh, I will think I have this all figured out, I think I have this all set, but I'll get to a point where I can't do it on my own, where I can't do it in my own power. And it, inevitably, this is the time when my wife will say, hey, did you read the directions? Or did you watch a YouTube video? And usually the case is, no, I didn't, honey. I should probably go do that. I should probably do the right way to then actually fix this and do the right thing. And as I think about that, as I think about uh, even just the simple thing of fixing a drain, the issue isn't understanding the problem. I know what the problem is. The issue isn't how do I solve it. I know I need to get the, 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 the clog fixed. But really what it comes down to, the issue has always been, will my response be appropriate in order to receive the best end result. That's the issue that I face when I do that. And we see in John chapter 18 that Peter, one of Jesus' disciples, uh, had his own response to things. When Jesus was confronted in darkness to be arrested and tried and eventually crucified, Peter's first response was, hey, let's have a prayer meeting. 
Hey, let's sit down. Let's talk about this, guys. No. His first response is he grabs a sword and he starts swinging. He starts chopping. He starts hacking. And he actually cuts somebody's ear off. He gets a little crazy. Jesus calms it down, picks up the ear, heals the man. And then this is what he says in John chapter 18, verse 11. Jesus' response to Peter is this. But Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Shall I not drink from the cup of suffering that the Father has given me? See, Peter had his own way of doing it. Peter had his idea, this is how I should do this. That was his response. But he was confronted with Jesus saying, that's not how it's supposed to be. Maybe you find yourself trying to fix everything around you. You can't control the virus that we're facing and we're walking through. But you try to control your house. You try to control your family. You try to control the relationships around you. And you're trying, and you try, and you try, and that's your response. But you're still left fearful. You're still left wanting peace. You're still left with wanting more. Jesus is saying, just like he told Peter, stop doing it your way, and instead do it my way. Because you can trust me. Because I have your best interest in mind. Because I know what's best for you. This is the right way. The, the correct response for the best result is to do it my way. And to give and trust me. We are sinful. That sin separates us from him. We can't pay the price for our own sin. It's impossible. That's why Jesus had to come. So Jesus does come. And he does everything that we can't do. He pays a price that we could never pay. And he gives us the opportunity to respond to him and experience true and everlasting and full life. And the beauty of Christ's death is that it didn't stay there. He didn't stay dead. He rose again. And he's alive. And that's the hope, even in the pain. Did it hurt to pay the price on the cross? Absolutely. Absolutely it hurt. More than any of us will ever know. But our response can and should be to trust him and that's the way it needed to happen. And we can trust him. And every person who hears this good news has the chance to walk alongside him, to have a vibrant, growing, life-giving, full, fulfilled life when we trust him, when we do it his way. That's the hope given us on this day we call Good Friday. In a couple of days, we're going to celebrate our own unique and new ways to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's going to be different. We're not going to come together and wearing our Easter best and walking into church and all the pictures. We're we'll to have to figure out a new way to post our Easter pics on social media. But as I was thinking about this celebration, how we're going to do that here in a couple days, I was brought to that passage in Luke chapter 24, where it's post-Jesus rising from the dead. And there's two men walking on a road. And they're talking about what just happened in the area and what's happening in their community and, and this death and this, this supposed resurrection. And they're having this conversation and up alongside them comes Jesus. And for whatever reason, the scriptures tell us that they didn't recognize him. They didn't know who he was. And he begins to say, hey, what are you talking about? And they go, where have you been, Jesus? Basically paraphrased. What, or you live under a rock? Well, he was behind one for a couple days. Where were you? So they begin to tell him, this is what happened, and then this happened, and this is there, this is my thought, and this is how I'm responding. And then Jesus kind of says, okay, you guys are done? All right, here's how he responds in Luke 24. Jesus has his say. Verse 25 in Luke 24. It says, then Jesus said to them, you foolish people, you find it so hard to believe that all the prophets wrote what all the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. By this time, they were nearing Emmaus, and at the end of their journey, Jesus acted as if he were going on, but they begged him, stay with us, stay the night with us, since it's getting late. So he went home with them, and as they sat down to eat, he took bread and he blessed it. Then he broke it again and he gave it to them. Suddenly, their eyes were opened, and they recognized it. As we talked and prepared and prayed about these messages from these pastors, as these, this, this group got together, it was in this moment, it was this time, as we were believing for these moments right now, your response, we were praying that there would come a time in this message, whether it was early with Pastor Greg or early with Pastor Tim or right now, that the Holy Spirit would step into your life and all of a sudden your eyes would be open and you would see and recognize who Jesus is. That's what 
that's what we're presented with today. That's the response that we have to choose. How are we going to, to respond to this? That each and every person who hears or watches this service would we choose to respond to the gift of salvation that Jesus paid for on the cross, that Jesus conquered it, won as he rose again. That is the answer our world needs right now. None of us can tell you exactly how this whole COVID-19 thing is going to turn out. We don't know. But we do know that we do have a hope that does not disappoint. That in the end, Jesus wins. That we can trust him with everything because he knows best. That when we lay down our lives, we lay down our sin, we lay down our everything and say, Jesus, my response to you is yes. I need you. I give you who I am. That we win. So I close my time with you asking you the same question that Jesus asked Peter. Who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? How will you respond to Jesus today? If you're a believer here worshiping with us, again, we are so honored that you're with us. What has your response been during this time? As believers, as people who, Jesus is your foundation. How have you responded during this time? I challenged our, our church a couple weeks ago. I had the opportunity to share it. I said, now is the time for the church to rise up. Now is the time for the church to be the church, to point people to Jesus. Believers, how are you living out the faith in wisdom, in unity, in, in obedience to what God has asked us to do and in reverence for those around us and valuing what's happening? How is God using you? How are you responding to what is happening during this time? Jesus is opening doors like he never has before. And hearing the gospel and reaching those around you and praying. Maybe finally you've been able to just breathe. And your relationship with God has grown like it never has before. Believers, what's your response? But maybe again, you're sitting here and you're watching this and you're like, I haven't been to church in a long time. I, I happened upon this, this broadcast or I happened upon this video. And you're sitting there and you're realizing, yeah, that's me. I need Jesus. The problem is my sin. The solution is Jesus' is death on the cross and resurrection. And my response is saying yes to him. And in just a moment, I'm going to read, or I'm going to pray with you if you want to accept Christ in your life. But I want to read our main text again for us. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 and 4. It says, I passed on to you what was most important. And what has also been passed on to me, Christ died for our sins, just as the scriptures said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scriptures said. So if you're sitting here, you're listening, you're walking, maybe you're, I don't know where you're at hearing this or seeing this right now. But you're choosing right now in this moment to respond to Jesus saying, I need you. I just want to lead you in a simple prayer as I tell people all the time, this is not a magic formula. It's not magic words. It's simply your heart. But sometimes a little extra guide helps us. And so no matter where you're at hearing this and you're asking Christ in your life right now, I'm going to ask you to just stop for a moment, to close your eyes, just focus in. Right now is the most eternal moment you can ever have. And I want you to pray this prayer after me and say, Dear Jesus, I thank you that you showed me what is most important. I ask you now to forgive my sin. That is the problem. I thank you, Jesus, that you came to this earth, that you lived a perfect life, that you died for my sin and all sin. And I ask you now to forgive me, to make me brand new. Jesus, come into my life. My response to you now is to give you today and every day going forward. Thank you, Jesus, for forgiving me. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for making me brand new. I love you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, we are extremely excited. This is the moment that we prayed for as pastors and as people leading us in worship. And uh, again, thank you to Pastor Nate and Faith Lutheran for hosting us during this time. But here's the deal. If you responded, which is what we were praying for, this is the beginning. This isn't just something. It's not just a prayer you pray and go, oh, good, all right, Going to heaven, life's good. I'm going to keep going back to everything I did. No, here's our challenge. We don't just encourage you, and I don't just encourage you. I beg you. We beg you. Reach out to somebody else and tell them. Find a church. Contact one of the pastors that spoke this morning. Find a church near you that, is, that you can connect with and say, hey, I asked Jesus into my life. 
And they will walk alongside you and they'll help you respond more and more and more to be like Jesus. I thank you for our time together today. I thank you for the so many that made this day happen. He is risen. He's alive. And he's the answer. Thank you. My name is Brandon Belomo. I pastor Fellowship Bible Church of Piers. And on behalf of the other area evangelical churches, I want to say thank you for participating in this Good Friday service with us, even if from a distance. We do pray that you've been edified and built up and that your hand has been strengthened in these interesting times that we find ourselves. I'd like to give a special thank you to Little Falls Radio for airing this service uh, to help all of us stay a little bit more connected during this time. So thank you, Little Falls Radio, for doing your part and helping us stay connected in this time where everybody feels, at some degree, isolated from one another. Now, would you please receive this benediction from Romans chapter 15, verse 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound and overflow in hope. And all God's people said, Amen.